Hello, everyone. I'm Erica Ellis from Living Joyfully, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Anna Brown and Pam Larickia. Hello to you both. Hello. Hello. And before we get started, have you checked out livingjoyfullyshop.com yet? Our online shop has Pam's unschooling books, lots of helpful coaching options, and online courses such as Four Pillars of Unschooling, which is great if you're newer to unschooling, and Navigating Unschooling Wobbles if you're finding that back to school season has gotten you feeling unsure about things. We also have courses on validation and on navigating conflict. You can also learn more about the Living Joyfully Network there. And we're so excited to be creating a one-stop shop to support you along your unschooling journey. And we hope you'll check it out. Pam, would you like to get us started with our topic for today, which is curiosity-led learning? Yes, I would love to, because I feel like this is one of the kind of first big paradigm shifts that people encounter and that I encounter uh, when I began exploring unschooling in earnest. But, you know, even if you've been unschooling for years, I would not be surprised if just like listening in on this conversation reveals yet another layer that you can peel back around the value of curiosity led learning. Like, oh, it applies here too. Like, I'm still getting those little layers as, you know, you encounter it out in the wild in our lives, right? There's always, always more layers. <laughs> Yeah. But culturally, the message is that learning must be led by curricula, right? That there's a step-by-step -step linear process that needs to be followed for real, quote, learning to happen. And that learning is hard. Like, that's challenging. Here's the next step. Learn this. Here's the next step. And what unschooling does is as, uh, encourage us to ask ourselves, is that the only way to learn because yeah you know, some people pick that pick things up that way we all went through for the most part school that way and we learned you know uh what we did um and then it's always fun to look back and like how much did i remember how do i define learning is that really learning if really i can just do it on a worksheet but i have no idea how to bring that into my days and into my life like, it's just a beautiful, beautiful paradigm shift when you start looking, oh, are there other ways to learn? Oh, is this other learning that I'm doing, just because I love this thing, does it discount the learning I'm doing about <laughs> it? Like, if it's not hard, is it learning? Like, there's just so many ways to look at it. And then when we, when we give ourselves enough space to start questioning it and start looking at, okay, well, you know, I know this was really fun, but I have been learning lots and it's been useful learning for me. Um, you know, does that count? And just start looking at it through that lens and, and recognizing things like, oh my gosh, it doesn't feel hard. Even though you may notice like um, other people, oh my gosh, how did you learn? all that, that depth of knowledge, et cetera. And they're talking about it being difficult, whereas it feels much easier to us because we were interested in it in the first place, because our curiosity was guiding us. And we're like, oh yes, I want more, I want more, I want more. So when we start to notice all those little different aspects of it and start to bring that all together, uh, we start to play with what does curiosity-led learning look like? And wow, it's pretty darn amazing. It really is valuable. It's like all the things. And, oh, we can start to replace uh, what is curriculum led, like what somebody else thinks we should be learning with what we're interested in learning. And it just, just opens up this whole, I was going to say box. It's just like removes the box <laughs> on what learning can look like for us. <laughs> Candid. <laughs> I think for me, I think what's so interesting is I feel like this is actually the natural process, how we all as adults learn like, okay, there's something that I want to do. And so what do I need to know in order to do that thing, you know, and so then it's the relevant pieces that, you know, maybe I want to take up this hobby and I need to learn this, or maybe I want to, you know, take this particular job and gosh, I better learn these things. 
And it, it's, be, but it's so relevant. So for me, it's about bringing that like relevant piece to it. And, and that is, you kind of mentioned this, where the retaining comes in. Because when it's something that we're using every day or is relevant to something that we're interested in, we actually do retain it because we're practicing, we're using, we're tweaking all the time. And so I think that piece is so interesting that we, our school has kind of separated that and made it very irrelevant. So we're learning and putting things on a piece of paper. We don't really understand why. And so what I learned in school was really how to do that, how to take and memorize information and give it to them in the form that they wanted. But it's interesting to me now as an adult, sometimes I'll think about something that, you know, was covered in school and I'm like, that's why, <laughs> you know, they wanted that to be covered, but it meant nothing to me in the 30 years in between. But now I'm like, now that it's relevant, I can go back and refresh. I don't remember it from then, but I can go back and refresh. But I thought, oh, how interesting, because somebody somewhere thought this was important in their life. And so they wanted kids to know it. And it's uh, it's just like, it doesn't, we don't, I don't feel like humans learn that way. Right. I, oh, it's so interesting, isn't it? Like, I, I just feel like what has happened is that the way that schools do things has kind of like, it's become the definition of what learning is. But if you really think about it, like it doesn't work, like our brains do not work that way. But if we think learning is, learning is someone tells you what you need to know it's this in this order, it's these important things, these facts at this age, whatever. Um, then the curiosity part, it never even gets looked at or considered. It's like it's not even a consideration at all. But we know from ourselves, from watching our kids, just from looking at people, like you've seen the glazed over eyes of kids in class, certainly. I mean, certainly over the years, I have seen that as a teacher and I've seen it as a student. And like information is not getting in there. So as far as like just choosing to teach someone something that they're not interested in, that's not causing learning to happen. And so I really think we need to just change the definition. Like don't call it learning if all you're doing is, you know, having someone <laughs> lecture to someone else about something that they don't want to know, you know, that's not learning. And so um, I feel like a lot of the quote learning that I did in school was that temporary memorize it, cram it in my brain, get it out onto the paper for the test, and then it's gone. And so you know, nowadays I can look back and just be like, what was the use of that time for me? You know, other than, like you said, learning to memorize, learning to take tests, that kind of thing. And so in my life with my kids, I mean, thankfully, like, you know, when I was in school, I was so interested in doing well in school that that itself kind of became my interest. And so then, you know, learning the things in class to do on the tests, that like, that process was more my interest because I wanted to get the good grades. My kids do not have this personality. And so, um, you know, with them, it really, it just has to be curiosity led. I can't see another way. Like they don't want to learn things that they're not interested in. And so, um, and then the fun part is then how fun, natural, easy, you know, all the things like they will dive so deeply into things that they're interested in. And so, um, yeah, now I see it as kind of the only way for learning to happen is through curiosity. Yeah, it's really how you define learning, right? Is learning the the regurgitation piece for the grades? Is it the retention piece? We'll get to and if for those peeling back more layers, do we even need to look at learning? <laughs> right. Right. That's a topic for another conversation. But, oh, there was, there was like two or three pieces that I really wanted to pull out, Erica, from what you said there. One was, let's call it something else. And you know what popped to mind was, let's call that teaching. Like teaching yes. is done doesn't mean learning is happening. Like teaching yeah. is somebody else telling people, like, you're going to know this and this is the process to get this answer. And, you know, this is a noun and et cetera. And so the teaching happens, whether or not the learning happens, like you're saying, Erica, I love the distinction of, 
you know, what came to be my interest was getting good grades, which is then again, another conversation, <laughs> but that is what helped you move through the, the school process, you know, exist in that environment, the, take stuff in from the teaching and then, you know, spew it out on the test for the grades, like totally, totally fine. And what is super interesting and what I found, like you mentioned too, Anna, is that it's like it, it's the retention just isn't there when you're not using it or interested in it. Because like for me, I like to, one of the big shifts with this shift to curiosity-led learning was looking at learning from my child's perspective or from mine, if I'm looking at my own perspective. But that helped me start to recognize when it was actually learning I was talking about and not teaching. And to make that distinction between the two, it's sometimes my kids are interested in learning something and want some information, but there the interest is there first. And then they're going to like soak it in. They're going to ask questions. They're going to be, but, but why? <laughs> but how, you know, and then you get into that conversation. They pick up what they're interested in. That helps them make that next connection and that next connection, and then they move on. And it doesn't have to be a week's worth of worksheets and repetition, et cetera, because they were ready to soak that in. And then the other piece that I really enjoy um, when I think about learning, because so much of the school, as we were talking about, is that linear you know, curricula. You learn this and then learn this and then learn this. Like this is the best way to put this knowledge together but my preference over the year has years has really become thinking of learning more as a web of connections of like oh there's this piece and this piece and this piece because truly when you break uh subjects down there is really so much crossover in the real world like there is math all over the place. There's there's math in in poetry, in in words. There's math in geography. There's math. That, there's just so much crossover that once you once you start breaking them into the silos of subjects, you lose that richness. Whereas when you're following your curiosity and just seeing where it leads you, you know you may end up over in one subject for a couple of days and then back into another subject, but you're making connections between it all. There's just a, a much bigger, deeper richness to the learning that happens when you're following the things that you're curious about, the things that you're interested in. Doesn't mean that you're not gonna do the hard things. I think that's one of the um, little stumbling blocks that can come up when people are first learning about, well, if we're just going to follow our interests, we're never going to do anything hard because if something looks hard, I'm not going to, well, you know, look at your kids and actually notice so often when they're frustrated so often, that's because they're wanting to do something that is hard for them right now, but they want to do it. So they're going to keep going. Even if you wish like, okay, let's go do something else for a while because <laughs> you're uncomfortable with the frustration. But no, I mean, that there's beauty in that frustration as well. And of course, you know, we want to support, give space, like hold all those pieces for them. But it's not wrong to be frustrated. It doesn't mean they're not a good learner because they're frustrated. It, like, it means none of those things. It means, oh, they're really determined in this moment. And, you know, how can I help them if they're looking for some help? to start putting something together, like what's that little connection they're missing in their web, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, something you said, Erica, it, it's, and it was about the learning and finding, I think it's really helpful if people find themselves saying things like, I don't think they're learning anything, you know, they're playing games all the time, or they're doing, you know, outside, you know, doing building forts all the time, like they're not learning. I think this is really important to, to really ask yourself, what do I think learning means? You know, am I only looking at it through this lens of 
well, they're not sitting down doing, you know, fractions or times tables or this, because really learning as humans is so much broader than that. And so I loved how you pointed out that we've kind of taken this system that's really a subset and hasn't always been around you know, as to define this concept that is just really innate to humans. Like we are just learning machines. How do we survive the day? How do we get through this? How do we do like that is what we do. And so so I think when you hear yourself saying things like that, go, oh, wait a minute, like what, what am I defining as learn and why? Like, it, and it's important, it's the right or wrong answer. It's just have a little kind of examination, I think, important. And one of the things I also want to say was the hard thing, right? Because, you know, we said it, it's easier when it's, it, when it's, um, it's led by, ooh, hopefully my internet's still here, um, led by our curiosity, but it can be hard, right? It can, it can be frustrating. It can take time and that's okay too, because what you'll see is there's this drive to fit out and sometimes walk away. From it and then sometimes come back, but it's just so much more natural. And I love that. And then another thing Pam reminded me of um, so Pam is amazing at technology and says all of these things. I am not as much, I mean, not terrible if you put me on the scale of the world, but I'm not good. And so I really don't retain all the of all the different different pieces that I use, even things I use pretty regularly. Because it just isn't a passion area for me. And so I think it's just interesting about ourselves and think, oh, yeah, that's kind of how it works. If I need to know, I can Google it. I can figure out. I ask Pam. She's like, oh, my gosh, she's asking me again. But it's okay, you know. So I think just thinking about how we do things and then recognizing that our kids are human, too, doing things, it can really help when we get stuck in this place. Right, exactly. Like. Um, I just feel like once we start thinking about ourselves and how we actually really learn, like it just, I don't know, it, it becomes this different way that we can look at our kids. And I think sometimes when we first go into parenting, first go into the idea of, you know, like how children learn, it's just old tapes of, you know, what we've been told over the years of like, you know, school is the place you learn. You have to know these things. This is what it should look like. And so, right. I, I loved my unschooling journey just, you know, for that kind of process of questioning that and being like, wait a second, like if, if I can learn things, anything I want now, like they can also learn anything they want at any time. And I don't know, there's just a lot of freedom in that. And then I was also thinking, um, you know, like you, a lot of people have had the experience too in school of like, maybe they do hit on a topic that you might be interested in. And then they say, that's enough of that. Let's move on to something else, you know? And so that's, that's a really huge benefit of unschooling is just like, oh my gosh, like I found something I want to do. Can I do more of this? And the answer is always yes, you know? Um, and they can just dive as deeply as they want. And so then we meet really interesting children who have so much knowledge in this one super deep area um, that's just incredible. And so they may not have all of their, you know, whatever other skills that the school would be looking for at that age, but they have spent their time learning about something that's so important and interesting to them. And from there, you know, whatever they want to do in life, like it becomes obvious what they might be curious about next. And so I, I find that so much with my kids who are now, you know, young teenagers, it's like they used to be so focused on certain things. And then now it's different. It's like they're in a new phase. They're finding new new aspects of life that now they're curious about and interested in like how am I going to manage to do this in my life I want to do this and I want I know that I need to learn more things to get there you know and so it's just a very different like I felt very directed down a path where it feels like for them they're making a path and seeing where they want to go and then telling me I really want to work on my handwriting because that would really help me with this. And I'm just like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's, it's a completely different approach. I want to jump in because that's what was bubbling in my head, Erica. You like nailed it right there is one thing when you're making the shift away from curriculum and into curiosity and interests is it's fascinating to note how much of the curriculum, certainly in the younger years is 
skill-based, like reading and math and handwriting, like those skills, whereas that's not really what you're going to see very often <laughs> um, in, in unschooling lives because they're following their interests. But what they're doing, instead of learning the skill, like, you know, two plus two is four. And then now let's take that into the world. Here's, you know, here's how to read beginner books. Now let's take that into the world. Our kids are, like you said, they're, they're doing stuff and they're like, oh, hey, like I'm playing this game and I've got these boss statistics I need to manage. I'm going to figure out how those numbers are working and what formula is back there, et cetera, et cetera. And, or, you know, I really want to, um, you know, read this forum. And yes, my parents, somebody's helping me read it for a while. And then I'm starting to pick it up or I'm wanting to try and read because somebody doesn't have time to, isn't able to read for me for 12 hours, you know, like all those pieces. So our kids are doing the things in the world and picking up the skills along the way. They're not like, I want to learn the skill. And now I can finally go and play that game. Or now I can finally go and read this book, you know, or the handwriting. Yes, go in. <laughs> Well, it's exactly this, though. I'm just going to like take it the next step, because what's so incredible about that is if we're really true and really honest with ourselves, we don't know what skills are going to be needed for the next generation and for five years from now and for 10 years from now. Because I think about the books that were the standard, you know, when I was in school, which would probably I mean, they probably wouldn't even believe it if kids today read some of the stuff that they thought we needed to know then. And so what's so great when it's coming the other direction, they're able to take it way further than this curriculum can lead them because that's actually pinning them in. But if they're following interests and creating new things and making new discoveries and then getting the skills along the way, yes, those skills can be foundational, but because they're foundational, they're always going to learn them. They're just going to learn them through something that's interesting and maybe taking them way beyond what we could have done with the curriculum. So I just, I, I love that so much. Go, Erica. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, for me, that was exactly... That was another one of the huge shifts, right? It was truly just yeah. understanding that, oh, it's not that I'm throwing out the curriculum and they will never learn how to spell right. and they'll never right. learn how to read and like their math skills will be atrocious. Each of those things is so much bigger when you're actually in the world. Like back to what you were talking about at the very beginning, beginning Anna, about just being in the world and living in the world. And we're just picking up those skills. And yes, if they are actually foundational to living a human life, wherever it is that we're living, you are going to come across the need for them as yeah. you're living. Absolutely. <laughs> right. That's why they're foundational. Yeah. We don't have to force it, you know, and we don't have to pull it out because I think, I feel like the way that schools can separate learning from life and reality almost makes it feel mysterious and difficult. Like, you know, what does this mean? Why am I having to do it? And like you said, you're the drills, the drills, the drills. And what I found so interesting with my girls is we... In our state at the time, we had to take kind of a standardized test every couple of years, I think, maybe every year. Um, it's been a little while. But what was so interesting to me is they would be able to do all of these, you know, English things and, and looking at sentences and, and picking the right word. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, we know. I remember filling out those sheets with making the verb match the tense of the thing. And they never did that. They learned it from talking, being spoken to, reading books having books read to them, playing games. They learned the language that was around them because they were in the world. And I think that's what's empowering about that is I think they had a belief, I see it in them as adults, that they can figure things out. They can learn things. Whereas I think school kind of makes it mysterious. Like, no, you have to be in this room and someone that's an expert is going to tell you, and then you're going to have to really work hard and practice it to learn it. 
And I just don't think that's true, you know? And so I think it's really interesting to, again, what I love about unschooling is just that questioning. We can start questioning, is that true? It does that make sense? Do I see that in my life as an adult? Does it really play out when I'm watching my kids organically learn? And that's when I think things get really interesting. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I, I just think it, well, it can like just the school model can just lead to people thinking that they can't learn, right? you know, right. where really it's like, I can't memorize stuff that I'm not interested in, which I think yeah. is just yeah. natural, is, you know? Right, right. And so, or like, I can't memorize stuff that makes no sense to me and I can't use it anywhere in my life. Like, I think that's reasonable, but like to conclude that then that means I can't learn, like, it's just so sad that 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 is the result of so much of of school style teaching and you know i i see it a little bit just culturally with my kids you know where they'll have some of these beliefs of like i'm supposed to know this or you know well in school they do this and i can't do this or i don't know if i would be able to and so I mean, it's interesting that those things still come up, even though, you know, they can make their own decisions and learn all kinds of things. And so it's just interesting to have those conversations with them about like, well, what are the things that you want to do? And there are, thankfully, outside of school, there are an infinite number of ways to learn the things that they want to learn. And so um we're we're working through some new computer programs with Oliver. And he took a look at one the other day and he was just like, I don't think I can learn this. And I was like, it looks super overwhelming at first, but I'm sure that we can figure out either, you know, someone who is an expert who could work with you on it, or we could look up videos and, you know, there's just so many ways. And so I think, um, you know, in, so, in some moments we run into those, like, I'm not practiced at learning kind of ideas that they have about it, but then it's fun to point out to them, but that's all you do, you know, like that really is what you've done your whole life. It just doesn't yeah. feel like what it looks like in the stories or what you hear about with your friends who are in school. Right. And that what's so important about that piece that you just put out there is what I recognized was that my role was my energy about that. So because I think what can happen is if you hear your child say, I don't know how to do that. And I, you know, I this person knows how to do this and I don't know how to do it suddenly all of our tapes come and the mother-in-law's tape and the thing going, oh, we failed them. We've done this. But really it, it was just what you were saying. It was, I was like, wait a minute, I've lived with you all these years. I've seen you learn things that I can't even learn. Like, oh my gosh, we just need some different tools. Or you, if this is something you're interested in now, then here's the thing. But they really look to me for my energy. So if I brought heaviness about, oh my gosh, you don't know how to do that. And we better do this and that, or we need to, you know, jump back into that. I think it really would have changed that. And instead, it was just like you said, just empowering them, like you are learning incredible things every day and you can learn whatever you want. Let's figure out what you need and we'll do it together. So just, you know, watching that energy and making sure that I'm not letting other, you know, the tapes from other people come into that relationship with my child. Yeah. And I think that's, that's definitely us doing our work of practicing, yeah. like, because like you said, that just brings back all those messages. Oh, but if they were in school, they would have learned this in this grade and this and this grade. And taking that kind of leap to the future as in like how we learn as adults. And I think for me, the shift to just thinking of us all as human beings and like yeah. wherever we are as a human being in this moment and what we're interested in learning. And even if it feels overwhelming in the moment like oh my gosh I something I continue to do <laughs> is like kind of like use your time machine idea Anna which is like when I'm something like holy crap I have no idea I was like wow I can just imagine in six months when I'm sitting here and just biffing along that's going to be so cool and that just kind of helps me take that next step it's like oh yeah you know give myself a bunch of time and I'll just figure it out along the way. I'll play with it. And it's that's the way human beings yeah. learn, as you were mentioning yeah. earlier. So to be able to take that, like our messages and our fears around school and kids, and to be able to just say, this is human beings and learning stuff. 
that helped me so much anyway to just move through those moments because of course like those cultural messages are everywhere it's not just that we learn them growing up and then now we have them we also hear them all the time (laughs) you know in this back to school season we hear them even more and it can have us questioning ourselves you know so I think it's so useful for us to do that bit of processing for ourselves because as you said Anna the energy that we show up with Uh, can make all the difference like if we show up with oh my gosh something's wrong that needs fixing or oh my goodness yes that's you know that looks like a a lot of stuff to take in that's just you know one bite at a time as they say you know baby steps whatever kind of language helps for them and helps for you as you move through it to remember like this is just learning and it I think it's threaded through our entire conversation. I don't know that we've said it out loud, but we can learn something at every age. So just because something, you know, that maybe in school they covered in grade four, like I I always go back to like pioneer times because that was when Joseph left school. (laughs) That was like one of the topics going on. It's like, it doesn't matter at what age. It doesn't even matter if, but you know, whatever age something comes up about pioneer times that that period of history and they're curious about it they can learn it at any time there is no need for it to be done at a certain age you can see why that's useful inside a school curriculum because you don't want like three years in a row for the teacher to love pioneer times and they have to do it for three (laughs) years in a row they have to break it up that way, right? So, okay, this is the chunk. There's there's often not much more logic than that. Like, we, we've we got this many years of history to cover. Let's do this much each, et cetera. You know, same with geography. Yeah. Same with so many of it, right? Any age. We can learn anything at any age. I think that's... Now I'm exactly. super curious what Canadian pioneer times are like. I'm going to have to look it up and learn at 55. We went to Black teach Beach Pioneer <laughs> Village. <laughs> what they we teach. love that place. That was what actually ended up being, you know, so I found it at the time because I was very new to school. Well, we can do this instead. This is how we can yeah. learn it outside uh, because he was finding it interesting at the time. But it ended up being one of our favorite places to go as a family for like the first two years because, you know, and so we got a park pass. It was part of our park area, um, like passes. Anyway, so we could go. There's like no cars, so you could walk around. We would bring like walkie talkies before phones and like play tag because we could all just be within this area. And it wasn't huge. Like we could give, we would give like clues. I'm beside a big steeple or, you know, I (laughs) see horses, like clues like that. And we would go and find each other. And my gosh, they like simmered in pioneer times (laughs) for so much for two years, like I said, at least. And we go back there just for the memories. We went a couple years ago. Anyway, so yeah, exactly. (laughs) Any age, any age. (laughs) Right. And any topic. I love that so much. Well, This has been so much fun as expected. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed our conversation and maybe had an aha moment or picked up some ideas to consider on your own unschooling journey. And if you enjoy these kinds of conversations, I think you would love the Living Joyfully Network. It is such an amazing group of people connecting and having thoughtful conversations about all the things we encounter in our unschooling lives. You can learn more about the network at livingjoyfully.com or sorry, livingjoyfully.ca forward slash network or on livingjoyfullyshop.com. We hope to meet you there and thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.